from me. As always, we can't wait to hear from our awesome senior pastor. Why don't we put our hands together and welcome Pastor Mel. Fantastic. How is everybody this morning? Are we good? It's so good to be in God's house, eh? It's in his presence, just his peace, and just with other believers, it's awesome, hey? And uh, we're day seven of our fast for those that are fasting. Uh, day seven, anyone fasting? Are we there? Yes, nearly falling over. <laughs> so it's good. Welcome to our online uh, as well. And so we're going to kick off with our soul focus um, this morning. As you can see, we've got our soul focus box here. And there's many names in this box, family, friends, co-workers, colleagues. And uh, we've been praying uh, for these people that are in this box. And we're going to add to the box today. We're going to have an opportunity. You've got cards on your seats, so get ready. God's going to lay people on your, on your heart this morning. And uh, as I'm speaking, as I'm preaching, God's going to put people on your heart. And you're going to write it down if you'd like to. And we're going to come forward and put it in the box here. Is that cool? I'm excited. Uh, You know, I think back to a time uh, where I lived my life without Jesus Christ. And you know, I don't think I ever want to go back there again. There's no way I want to go back to a time where I lived my life without Jesus Christ. I think about the hopelessness. I think about the bondage. I think about uh, happiness. You know, I think about happiness that was only based on circumstances. You know, when you're a believer, you have this inner joy. It doesn't matter what you're going through. If you've had the hardest week ever, it doesn't matter. You always have this joy. But when you're not a believer, your happiness, you're so up and down because it's based on your circumstances. I think about the independence that is required when you're not a believer. You're so, you have to be so independent. You have to like get it done in your own strength. You, you think you're on your own. You're independent. And I think about that and how I lived my life and I thought that I had to do it by myself. I think about the darkness, the addiction, the lack of peace. And you know what else I think about? I think about eternity and where I could have ended up had I not met Jesus Christ. I think about that. It's a real place and I could have been there. And I think about these things and I'm ever so grateful that that people took the time to reach out to me. I'm ever so grateful that people introduced me to Jesus Christ. I'm ever so grateful that that people provided me a spiritual home. I'm ever so grateful that I had spiritual oversight, that people mostly just loved me. I'm ever so grateful for that. And I know many of you feel the same way as well, that you're so grateful that someone reached out to you, that you're so grateful that someone invited you to church, that you're so grateful that you have a spiritual home here, that there's spiritual oversight, that there's a covering over you, that you're ever so grateful for that. The friendships that you built, the growth groups that are provided for you, the youth group we have on a Tuesday night. You know, we have about 10 youth that come on a Tuesday night and hear the word of God. Isn't that awesome? And I know you guys are grateful for that, that you can come and raise your families in this place, that God orchestrated and positioned people around you to minister to the gospel, to pour out their love upon you, to show you that Jesus Christ made a way so that you could be back in relationship with your heavenly father, because that's where we belong, in relationship with our heavenly father. And we wonder how we ever did life without him. You know, with all that life throws at us, the obstacles we face, the hurdles, the challenges we face, and we all face them, don't we? They're, they're, they're real things. And, and you wonder how you ever did life without him, particularly with everything that, that is going on in the world. You know, I think about Australia right now, and I'm really burdened with what's happening, the challenges that we're facing. You know, I think about these things, particularly right now in this day and age. You know, the whole earth is being shaken. Australia is being challenged. The whole earth is being shaken. But we serve a God who is steadfast. We serve a God who is steady. We serve a God where we can put our hope in his unfailing love. It doesn't matter what's going on around because we always have hope in him. Our help comes from him, the maker of heaven and earth. And it's so important, church, that we're keeping our eyes fixed on him because you can be swept away with all that's happening. And I'm saying, use your voice, do what you need to do, but keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. It's so integral right now. And I'm so blown away by how good he is to us. 
he's just so incredibly kind. He's so incredibly generous towards us. You know, the miracles we've seen, and you've all seen miracles in your own lives. You could name them right now. Miracles that you've seen. We heard about some this morning. I mean, this guy went in for a heart procedure. He's had issues for months, months and months. And they're just like, it's your heart beats fine. <laughs> he said, I got dressed and I went home. That's crazy. It's a miracle right before our very eyes. The love we've experienced, the freedom that we've walked in, the victory we have as believers. We can always put our trust in him. And I know that though so many of you desire that your family members and your friends and your colleague, colleagues and, and, and your neighbours, you want them to experience the same freedom that you have, the same victory that you have. You want them to experience the same love that you have experienced. That no matter what they are going through, that there's always hope, that they know that there's always hope. Some people don't know that. I honestly thought, I honestly thought that there was no hope left for me when I didn't know Jesus. I thought that there was no other way out except for death. That's what I thought. I was in a big black hole and all I saw was death and darkness. I didn't know there was hope. I didn't know until come, someone come and said, there's hope. I said, is there really? I so desperately wanted to believe what they were saying. I wanted to grab a hold of it. I so desperately wanted to believe. There's people out there that don't know that there's hope. But we know there's always hope in Jesus Christ. And we want our loved ones to experience what we've experienced. The same freedom, the same love, the same peace, the same joy, the same victory, the same forgiveness. You know, some people are just, they can't forgive themselves for what they've done. And they need to know that there's forgiveness in Christ. There's always forgiveness in Christ. We want them to know this same God that we do. And we want them to build a relationship with him. Not just know him, but, but build a relationship with him. We, we want them to come into a community of believers like we are in right now. We want them to experience what that is like. And most of all, we want to spend eternity with our loved ones. I'm sure all of us do. We don't want to be in one place and them in another. None of us want that. We want to spend eternity with our loved ones. And we know that there is a God who did everything for everyone to experience that. In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The famous scripture, John 3.16. And so we understand that God's heart is for those that don't know him. His heart is for his kids that aren't yet in his kingdom. We get that. We know that. And he calls us as believers to partner with him. That's amazing. Yeah. If you think about it, the Lord God Almighty wants to partner with us yeah. in reaching his kids that don't know him. I was listening to a podcast the other day by um, a world-class speaker called Nick uh, Busick. I think that's how. Busick. He, he's, he was born with no arms and no legs. And I was listening to his podcast and he said, he said this, if God can use me who has no hands and feet to be his hands and feet, God can use anyone. And I thought that was fantastic because God calls us to be his hands and his feet. But it can be challenging at times, particularly in this day and age. You know, we live in a post-Christian society. Previously, we had Christianity in our schools, in our government, in, in the court of laws. These days, not so much. We live in a post-Christian society. And now we're having people that are growing up that, that don't know about God. They don't understand you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? They don't really want to know. They have formed their views and their opinions about Christianity and we as a church as a whole don't really have a good reputation in society. You know, when people think about the church, they think about abuse. They think about judgment. They think about, yes, hypo hypocrites. That's what they think when they think about the church. That we're seen as those that, that are against moving things forward, you know, because we're against gay marriage. 
We're against gender fluidity. We're against abortion, against things society thinks is going to move us forward and they see us standing in the way. And so how are we meant to share our faith in today's society? It's not like it used to be. It's not. We're in a post-Christian society. How do we share our faith? Lord, help us. Lord, help us. But the answer is you. You are the answer. You personally and me. I don't exclude myself. You are the answer. These challenges that we face, that the church faces as a whole, places before each of us an incredible opportunity. Because where there's a problem, there's always an opportunity. Depends how you look at it, right? You can put your doona over your head like I feel like doing some days and say, I'm not, I don't, no, not today. <laughs> I just got nothing left in me, Lord. Who ever feels like that or is that just me? I think I felt like that three times this week. And I was thinking, Lord, give me some snaggers or meat or chicken or something because I'm starving. But no, it's just a banana and some nuts and some salad. It's all right if you're Karen. I think she eats like that anyway. I don't know. But it places before us an incredible opportunity. Though many people we interact with in our everyday life may have a negative view on Christianity, but because they know you personally, it can change things. How awesome is that? Because they know you, it can change things. And you know, we're all called to evangelize. We are all, it's not just for the evangelists. In fact, the evangelist's job is to equip the saints for works of service, the same as the apostles, the same as the teachers, the same as the pastors. It's the evangelist's job to equip the saints to evangelize. You are the answer. I am the answer to equip us to be able to evangelize our friends, our relatives, our co-workers and our neighbors. 1 Corinthians 5.18 says, 2 Corinthians, because we discovered it wasn't one, right, Jordan? And God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciling others to God. So that is the new assignment that you are given when you become a, a believer. It's your new mandate. It's your new assignment personally. And it's so important in how we interact with people and how we build relationships as Christians, how we treat our loved ones, how we treat our co-workers, how we treat our wives, our husbands, how we treat our neighbours. It's so important in how we interact with people because remember, it's you. You could be the key to helping change their view, to helping them enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's important that we are actually interacting with non-believers. <laughs> that we're not just in our little Christian circle bubble and that's all we do. We need to be interacting with non-believers. Otherwise, you've got, we've got to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing? What are we doing? We have to be interacting with non-believers. You know, Jesus was accused of being a drunk and a glutton because he ate and drank with sinners. But he said to the Pharisees and the religious leaders that challenged him in Luke chapter 5, 31, it says this, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so it's important that we actually merge our worlds as Christians, that we don't keep them separate. You know, we've got our Christian friends on this side and we've got our non-Christian friends on that side. We're meant to merge our worlds together, not have it like that and be kept separate. You know, Jesus went to the house of a new believer. His name was Levi and Levi invited him. He threw on a great banquet for Jesus and he invited Levi to come to his house and have dinner. And the Bible actually says that, that all of Levi's non-Christian friends were there. So all his tax collector friends, and they were bad dudes in that day. Gangsters, like they were bad dudes. And so the scripture says a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. And so Jesus was hanging out with all of Levi's non-Christian friends, his non-believing friends, because he wasn't afraid to merge his worlds. We have to be merging our worlds together. 
if we want to see those around us know the same God that we do. It's okay to gather your non-Christian friends and your Christian friends together. It's okay. It's what we're meant to be doing. I think sometimes we think we've become too holy maybe to be able to do that. We're worried maybe that one of our non-Christian friends might drop a swear word or say something inappropriate. Or we're worried our Christian friend is being super, super weird. You know those type that have your non-Christian friends running out the door? And so we're worried about these things. Jesus didn't care, did he? He just went and was himself because his worlds were merged together. We shouldn't be so like finicky about these things as believers because how are we going to reach the world? And I'm not encouraging swearing or saying inappropriate things. I'm not encouraging that at all. But there's this tension as Christians to live in this world but not be of it. And, you know, some people completely remove themselves from the world and, and they're, you know, I've, and I've done that in my past and to a degree I had to because they I just needed to for, from the background that I come from and I'm, so I'm not saying, you know, just take, make sure you put all this that I'm saying in context. Uh, and so, but, but if we're removing ourselves completely from the world, how, how can we be the hands and feet of Jesus? That doesn't make sense. And then we have others that, that merge their worlds together, but there's temptations to compromise their faith and people do compromise. And so that's the flip side as well. You merge your worlds and you compromise and God doesn't ask us to do that either. So it's finding how to live in the world at a godly standard with God's morals, with God's values, with integrity not separating yourself but living in the world with his standards, his values, being integrous in that. That's what God calls us to do. You know, Jesus prayed a prayer for his disciples and he includes us in it. And it says this, John 17, 15, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So it's very clear here that Jesus sent us into the world. Because why? People need rescuing. People are drowning. People, people need to be pulled back from where they're staggering towards. But he prayed that we would be protected. He prayed that our hearts would be guarded, that would be protected from the evil one, that we would know his truth to live God's standard in the world. And so it's important that as we are merging our worlds together, that we stay prayed up. Jesus prayed for us, that we know our weaknesses. Don't be silly. Use wisdom, that we know our weaknesses that we soak ourselves in the word of God, that we know his truth, that we're sanctified by his truth, that we don't compromise. It's not like becoming like a certain person or becoming like what not God calls you to, but it's staying and living God's standard to be his hands and feet, to pour out his love upon his people. And that's what it comes down to. It's simply loving people. You know, we can't be one way in church and then another way throughout the week. You know, if you're rude and arrogant, for instance, people aren't going to want to be around you. Let's just start there. (laughs) And they're certainly not going to want to know the gospel or what you have to share about the gospel. They're not really going to want to build relationship with you if you are a certain way throughout the week. And so it comes back to our relationships and building relationships. If we gossip and enter into politics at work, for instance, and behave no different to the next person, uh, people, again, won't want to be around you. They they, they don't want to hear the gospel from someone that's being like that. And so it's important that we are who we are, both in and out of church, in our every single day. How we behave every day is so important. Things are simple, and, and I'm getting super practical here, but... Answering emails. 
returning phone calls, texting someone back. I know it's basic, but we're building relationship. We're living with integrity. We want to be able to, at the end of the day, share the gospel with people. It's so important. Being above reproach in the workplace, in your everyday, every day, everyone, everywhere, every day. Being consistent, reliable, friendly, hospitable. You think, why are you talking about this? Because I've just seen Christians be one way in church on a Sunday and another way throughout the week, and that doesn't draw people to Christ. It's so important that people are just, they just want to be loved on. When I think back to the days that I met Jesus Christ, I just think about the love that people poured out upon me. It was the, the, it was the love that drew me. Non-judgmental. You know, if we're judgmental or critical, people will be put off and that just cements the view of what they already have about Christianity, about God, about Jesus Christ. And so it comes back to you being the answer in this post-Christian society that we're living in. The relationships that we're building and the ones that we currently have, God wants to use. He wants to use these relationships to introduce these people to Jesus Christ. And you know, also we carry the power of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. When we walk into a room, we carry the presence of God. So we don't need to be afraid of darkness because we've got the presence of God within us. And light propels out darkness, doesn't it? As soon as you turn on a light, what happens? The, the room's lit up, right? And so we don't need to be afraid of the darkness. Light pushes back darkness. Light overpowers darkness. The Pharisees were so worried about what was wrong and what was right that they forgot to just love people. Simply love. Loving people. When people were healed, instead of celebrating and glorifying God because they were healed, they were pointing out the fact that they were healed on a Sabbath. So they were focused on what was wrong instead of just loving and glorifying and praising God. Let's not be like the Pharisees in the Bible as Christians, as believers, pointing out everything that is wrong. But let's just be believers who love people, who love people, merging our worlds together, not compromising though, not compromising and living God's standard in this world. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says this, are you weary carrying a heavy burden? Come to me. I will refresh your life for I am your oasis. Doesn't that sound nice? Simply join your life with mine. Learn my ways and you'll discover that I'm gentle, humble and easy to please. God's easy to please. Isn't that so nice to hear? Like sometimes we strive and, and it depends on how you grew up as well, like what your background is, you know, your childhood. But some of us just strive just to please, but he's saying I'm easy to please. Doesn't that just take weight off your shoulders? I'm easy to please. You will find refreshment and rest in me. For all that I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. How awesome is that? All I require of you will be pleasant and easy to bear. Again, it was a love that I remembered when I first came to Jesus Christ. You know, and I was at a pretty bad place too. You know, probably just, you know, the worst of the worst, the downtrodden, the, you know, the things that I got up to in my past. But people just poured out their love upon me. People need to know that we genuinely care as we build relationship, that we genuinely care for them. And that is what changes people. The love of God changes people. It's nothing we can't control or change people. It's the love of God. And as people get to know you and that you're a believer, they know that you're a Christian, right? They should know that you're a Christian because we don't hide our light, right? We don't hide it. Their view will begin to change. It's like, hang on a minute, I know Lynn, I know Greg, I know Pat, I know Robin. And they're pretty cool people. They don't behave. I've got this view but that's not matching up. So what's going on here? And slowly but surely, things will begin to change. It comes back to you. 
you are the answer in this post-Christian society that we're living in. And they'll begin to ask questions. And they'll begin to say, hey, can you pray for me? I spin out when people that I think, you know, are bagging out God and then they're like, can you pray for me? And I'm like, hang on a minute. <laughs> I thought you said you didn't believe in God. I don't say that to them. I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> but something's changed, right? Some, something's happened. Yeah. A seed must have sort of got in there, right? And so you're starting to be the answer, correct? They'll begin to, 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 to just be overwhelmed with your love and kindness. You know, I think um, when Jacob was in one of his hospital visits this year, uh, I went to buy some kebabs for me and him. And uh, there was a lady next door. And I was like, do you want one too? And she was like, no, no, no. I was like, no, no, let me buy you a kebab. And this is just so simple. I hadn't planned to share it. And she was just spinning out that we would go and buy her ke a kebab. Like she could not get over the fact that we would do that. And so we bought the kebab and, and she enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Jacob enjoyed it with one of his many hospital visits this year. And, uh, and, uh, but the nurse, she's like, then the nurse came in and she's like, did you just buy next door that lady a kebab? And I'm like, yeah, why? Like what's, and she's like, I've never ever seen that before in my life. Someone being kind to the person, that, a stranger that you don't ever know. It actually blew her mind. We're like, that's weird. Like we don't understand because that's just how we live our life. As God is generous, we are generous. But these are the things where seeds begin to get planted. And so as you go along and you build relationship and they get to know you, they know that you're a Christian, they know you go to church, they ask you, why do you go to church? And you've got to have an answer. Why do you go to church? Why do you read your Bible? Have an answer. Why do you pray? Have an answer. Because they'll begin to ask you these questions. And then you'll have an opportunity to invite them to church. To be a part of a community. To be uplifted and empowered into all that God's got for them personally. And then you begin to be a part of seeing them walk in their journey with God. And it's an awesome thing to be a part of. It's exciting. So they can experience what it's like to be in God's kingdom. And we're int intentional about sharing our faith. You know, sometimes we walk away and it's like we should have, could have, would have. <laughs> so we kind of always need to be smart, thinking, intentional, not missing those opportunities because you know what? The Holy Spirit's going to provide opportunity and we need to understand when there's a glimpse, when there's an open door, so we're being led by the Spirit. And so we understand when we're in conversations what God wants to do. So it's being prayed up, it's listening you know, and sometimes there's this time to speak and sometimes there's not. <laughs> it's just listening or doing, acts of service, whatever it may be. The team can come up if they like. Matthew 5, chapter 14 says this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, our hearts cry, I know, is to see people spend eternity with Jesus. And everyone that is a believer can evangelize. Just have answers to those questions. Why do you go to church? Why do you pray? Why do you read your Bible? And for some of us, it's going to take boldness and it's going to take courage. You know, we've got to not worry what people think about us. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. You know, we can't change a person's heart. And as I've already said, it's God that changes. You know, it's, God, it's not you that's going to save them. Even though I'm saying you're the answer, it's God that will save them. It's only God that can turn a heart. You only do, it's God's, God's responsible for the outcome. So don't get too stressed out about the outcome. I've been praying for some people, some close family members for many, many years, and they look like they're going further into darkness. I understand it's not my responsibility per se God needs to work because the devil blinds hearts as well he blinds eyes and we understand it's a spiritual battle too but only God 
can save people. Only God can turn the hardest of hearts and he can turn the hardest of hearts. Jacob shares a story where his mate, uh, God asked Jacob while Jacob was in rehabilitation to pray for a certain guy. And Jake's like, I'm not praying for him. There's no way ever, ever, ever that he'll come to know Jesus. And this guy, he was in prison at the time and now he, he pastors a church and he's busy evangelizing and calling others into the kingdom. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing. Nothing is too hard for God. And I think it's funny when I talk to people and they say, oh, that person will never, ever, ever. I love it when I hear that because I'm gonna, God's going to blow your mind one day. God is going to blow your mind one day. But what he does ask us to do is he asks us to be his hands and feet. He asks us to, to, to be his mouthpiece. He asks us to step out. He asks us to be bold. He asks us to be courageous. He asks us to not separate our worlds, but merge our worlds together and not compromise, but live his standard in the world. He asks us to do that. And I'm not saying it's an easy task, but that's what he asks us, of us. And he's there to help us. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, In other words, it was through the anointed one that God was shepherding the world, not even keeping records of their transgressions. And he has entrusted to us the ministry of opening the door of reconciliation to God. So we're just a part of opening the door. We help open that door. We help open the door. God does the rest. And the question is, is have you accepted this personal responsibility from God? Do you realize that you, 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 not the person next to you, don't disqualify yourself. You are the answer. It's not the evangelist. Their job is to equip the saints. Have you accepted the assignment, the mission that God has given you? Do you walk around knowing that you're Christ's ambassador? How cool is that? That's what you are. That's what the Bible calls you. You're Christ's ambassador. Called to advance God's kingdom with intentionality. So key. And if you've not accepted the responsibility, if you've not recognised that that is what God's calling you to do, will you answer the call today? Will you say, okay, yes, God, let's do this. I'll partner with you. Let's partner together. It sounds like fun. And it is fun because you watch him do really, really cool things. Really cool things. But we do understand that it's not going to happen without prayer, which is why we have our soul focus box, because there is a spiritual battle. You know, like I said, for years we can be praying for one person and you just think, when God, when? There is a spiritual battle that happens in the spiritual realm. And so some people are, are really tied up in bondage as well. And so we need to pray and break through that, which is what we do here. And so prayer is absolutely essential if we want to see our loved ones and our community, our city and our nation come to know Jesus Christ, enter into a personal relationship. And so we're going to take a moment to write. God's going to put, or maybe already has, names on your heart right now, family members, colleagues, neighbours, whoever it may be. And as we worship, I would ask that you come forward and place it in this box. And we pray over this box throughout the week with our leadership team, with our prayer network. We pray over this. But before we do that, if there's anyone, I just want to give anyone an opportunity that's in this room that actually hasn't entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you're online as well, if you've never entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you've never experienced that joy, that love, that peace, today is your day. And so we're going to pray a prayer. It's a simple prayer. Pray it from the heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. So let's pray, church, after me. God, I thank you that you died on a cross so that I could be set free. I ask that you forgive my sins. I invite you into my heart, and I choose to live with you for eternity. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would love to connect with you, and if anyone in the rooms prayed it, or even a recommitment, would love to chat with you as well. But we're just going to take some time now uh, as we write down these names and we're going to pray over them in a minute. Let's sing. Jesus. Sing Jesus, what a saviour. Jesus. What a Savior, what a brother, what a friend, lifter. 